right. Good morning, everyone. All right. I love this group. You know, there are a couple of reasons why. One, I'm not uh, on any time constraint. I can go as long as I want. So I think today is like 5.15. So hopefully everything's going to be okay. And then two, this is the group that has no problems. Everything is perfect. And so you guys have it all nailed down. It's the other two services that really sinful people in those, in those services, right? You guys got it all together? All right. So we got one guy that is and everyone else no. All right. Just teasing you guys. So um, today we're going to continue in from last week. So it's a part one, part two. So if you missed last week, you can go back online. You can listen to it. There's a couple CDs left uh, on the way out. If you want the old school CD way, um, you can grab one and and get caught up. So we're going to do kind of um, catch up a little bit from where we were last week. And then we're going to jump in into today's uh, talk. So here's what I said last week, all right? I I said that you probably have had an experience in your life where you're going to work with someone, you know, or you hear something about someone uh, that you're going to be involved in. And maybe what you heard about them isn't really true, you know, or isn't isn't good. Maybe they're they're difficult to work with. They're hard-headed. They're opinionated. They're narrow-minded. I mean, whatever it is, right? And, And so you're a little bit concerned about getting into that kind of work relationship with them and so you decide okay well I'll go ahead and do that so you go into the relationship and and you start working with them and then all of a sudden you realize that what you heard about them wasn't true that they were actually delightful and very generous and wonderful and much like Pastor Dan and it's just absolutely wondering there's a joke in there wake up church and and so everything's perfect and and you go man I'm so glad that I didn't just base my opinion on what I heard but I actually got involved and got to know the person uh, in life. Now, I would say that if you've worked in any type of environment or you even, even did anything in, with your kids' sports, <clears throat> you've had one of those experiences where like, oh, no, you're on that guy's team? Ugh, right? <clears throat> and then you come to find out, oh, that's all good. So what if, what if what is being said is about you? Right? What if you're the complicated person and you're the narrow-minded person and you're the hard, hard-headed person and you're the one that you know, blows a fuse all the time and all this stuff? What if it's you? And then here's the interesting thing is, what if you're the one that believes it about yourself? It's not what somebody else is saying. It's actually what you believe about yourself. Now, here's what's interesting that happened last week. I had probably six people come up to me during the services, in between the services, and they come up to me and they're like, Pastor Dan, come here. And then they, they kind of said, well, you know, this is really weird. Um, I was talking to somebody in the lobby, and they were talking about how today's message and their thoughts and how they kind of end up in a destructive place, how the message was for them. And then they kind of look at me like a deer in a headlight, and they're like, I thought I was the only one that had my thoughts that kind of went into a bad spot, right? So just to kind of let you know how I plan messages, um, I don't preach to one person, all right? The messages typically fit everyone, and so the reality is we're more alike than not, and the reality is the six people who came up to me last week had the nerve to come up to me and share that with me. The reality is, is there were a lot of other people who recognized that their thought life ends up going in a bad spot, and the most critical person of you in most cases is you. And the most, the most hurtful conversations that you've ever had in your life is you talking to yourself, right? And, and so Paul has this idea in mind, and he's wrestling with it, and, and so he begins to kind of share with us in chapter 7 of Romans how we have two natures. And so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have two natures, okay? You have the old nature, and everyone say amen to that, and the old nature is the old self, and that's the old way of living, that's part of the sinful world in which you live in, and the more you think a thought, the easier it is for you to think that thought, and when you live in that environment of the old nature, guess what's natural to you? The old nature of thinking, the destructive thoughts that you have in your life. And Paul begins to say, you have a new nature, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a new nature in church world, we call it being born of the Spirit, there's kind of a negative uh, connotation to that, but it just simply means that you've invited Jesus in your life, you've been born of the Spirit, God dwells within you, the Holy Spirit dwells uh, within you. And so Paul says, as we're kind of recapping from last week, Paul says at the very top of your outline, Romans chapter 7, verse 15, 
and we all got this verse down good. Uh, it says, I do not understand what I do. Amen, right? You ever, you ever have that? For what I want to do, I do not do. And we can all agree with that. But what I hate, I do. Right? And so here's this conflict that Paul is having that he recognizes in his life. There are things that he wants to do and he ends up not doing it. There's things that's like, I'm never going to, and he ends up doing it. And he's wrestling with it uh, within himself. And so in verse uh, 21 of Romans 7, it says, For I find this law at work when I want to do good, right? Evil is right there with me. Now, why is evil with him? Because he has his old nature. His old nature follows him. And guess who follows you? Your old nature. And everywhere you go, you drag your old nature. And your old nature has a lot to say to you. Now, you don't believe what the, what the internet says. You don't believe what newspapers say. You don't believe what the news tells you. But you believe everything that your mind tells you. Right? Now, the question is, is why should you do that? So, so he, he goes on and he says... Um, he goes on and he, and he says, verse 23, but, uh, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, uh, waging war against the law of my, and what, what's the, where's the war going at in his life? In his mind, right? In his mind, in his thought process. <clears throat> and makes me a prisoner of the law of sin and death within the members, right? So here's this battle, this old nature, new nature, and where is it happening? It's not happening out there, it's happening in here, and he's struggling with it. And the thoughts that he has, he doesn't want to do and he ends up doing. And the things that he, does, he should do, he doesn't do. And he's wrestling with this internally in his life, all right? So last week we covered three of the self-destructive um, thoughts, which are in your outline. <clears throat> and so we covered one through three, and we'll go over them real quick. The first one is shame. And that is where we have, you know, uh, regrets and shame and guilt in our life, not conviction, Conviction is when you've done something wrong and the Holy Spirit points it out to you. Conviction always brings you to a closer relation to the Lord Jesus. Condemnation is from Satan. Condemnation drives you into the ground. All right, it brings you to a place of despair. You're not lovable. Look at you. How could you be con considered a believer? You know, all that kind of stuff. And so people walk around with a great deal of shame in their life. The second one is uncontrollable thoughts. And again, the worst conversations that you've ever had in your life is in your mind. And so you, you say things, you allow your mind to wonder, your thoughts wonder, you know, all those kinds of things. Three in your outline from last week is inner desires, and that is lustful thoughts that you have, impulses, compulsiveness, those kinds of things. Things that people will say, I just can't stop. And last week we learned that now as a believer, you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you can. You have a new power to be able to say, <clears throat> to say no in, in your life. All right, and then number four in your outline, which is where we're going to start today, and that is the area of fear, right? 85% 80, uh, of the things that we worry about never happen. The other 14% uh, of the things, just kidding, I just want you to make, kind of think I can't do math. Just making sure you guys are alert, right? <clears throat> so uh, one study says 91% of the things that we worry about never happen, right? So depending on what study it is, 85 to 91% of the things that we worry about. As I mentioned last week, um, just observations that's taking place in the lives of the folks who are at church. Um, when COVID first started, we were in we were fear, filled with fear. We didn't know what to think and all this other stuff. As time went on, we began to lessen and we got back into some sense of a rhythm in life. <clears throat> and now we're back to that again. Right, So if you're kind of in a family and you're struggling with more tension and you're like, what's going on? Folks, we're back to red. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things the news is saying, a lot of things the government's requiring, and those kinds of things. It's just creating a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear in the lives of people. So just, just know that, and we'll talk about how we address that. Uh, number five in your outline is hopelessness. And uh, we'll cover that. We live in a broken world, and so we end up getting to that place. For, uh, six in your outline is bitterness, and kind of the same thing. Uh, oftentimes people hurt us intentionally, unintentionally. We hurt other people intentionally, unintentionally. And then the last one is insecurity. And primarily insecurity comes from a place where somebody has rejected you. And so as a result, you struggle with relationships because you feel like I was rejected by, you know, fill in the blank, my dad, my ex, my wife, my whatever. And as a result of it, you have, uh, you've built up a lot of security and a lot of offenses around your life because you don't want to be rejected again. Right? And so we struggle with that when it comes to our relationship. 
So we'll cover those. So Paul goes on in Romans chapter 7, verse uh, 24, and he says this, what a wretched, and that means miserable, right? So what a miserable man I am. And if any of you have been in a place where you have shame, where you have uncontrollable thoughts, inner desires that you can't have victory over, you know, in, in any of the seven that I mentioned, that you know it is miserable. In fact, there's times in your life where you're so miserable, you can't even stand being with yourself. That true, right? And, and so then you try to find ways of escaping, And so he goes on and he says this, what a wretched man or what a miserable man I am. And then we looked at this last week, who, not what. Most people look for a what to fix those self-destructive thoughts. So they look for a what that will mask it, that will drown it, that will suppress it, that will do, you know, whatever it is in, in those areas of life but they know that they're miserable. They know that these thoughts are consuming them. And so they look for a what, and Paul says, it's a who. It's a who that fixes it. And so he says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, because this is the battle that's taking place, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law. And we would say, Pastor Dan, that's where I wanna be. Okay, and then look what he goes on. He says, but in the sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. There's the conflict that Paul is experiencing in his life. He desires to want to walk in the new nature. He desires for his thoughts to be there, but he realizes that he's got an old nature. And that old nature, everywhere he goes, it shows up. Right, And so how do you then begin to counter that where you begin to think less from the old nature thoughts and more into the new nature thoughts? How do you counter that in your life? Well, it's your choice. It's your choice. It's a decision that you need to make. It's habits that you need to create in your life to begin to think in those terms. And so we're going to skip one through three, as I mentioned last week, or or covered those last week. The the fill-in-the-blanks are there. You can listen to a CD. And we're going to drop down to number four, okay? So y'all ready? All right. So here we go. Number four in your outline, and this is dealing with fear, all right? So this is uh, four through seven. So fear is I must turn my thoughts toward God whenever I'm afraid, okay? It is a choice that you make. It's a decision that you make. It's something that you choose to do. The old nature says, get consumed with fear. And all of these thoughts are, they grow in our mind, don't they? It's like, it's like somebody dumped miracle grow on these things. And they just grow. Shame grows, right? Resentment grows. Bitterness grows. I mean, all this stuff begins to grow. And, and he says, so, so when, when we have fear in our life, we're focusing on the fear. You need to focus on the Father, not the fear. It's who has your, who has your focus in your life. And so in verse uh, 14 and following, here's, here's what he says. <clears throat> because those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. We just talked about, you know, sang songs about that, right? For, for, uh, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Now, why would he put the word again? It's part of the old nature. The slave to fear is part of the old nature. And he's saying, as a believer in Jesus Christ, God did not give you that fear, right? That, that, it's not a fight or flight. It's not like when the car's coming, you kind of go, I don't have fear. I'm going to stand here and see if I can, you know, take on the car. Obviously, that, you got to get out of the way, right? But, but he's talking about being consumed with the what ifs and all those kinds of things um, that oftentimes uh, takes place in our life. And he, he says that he did not give us that, that, that spirit where we're a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of what? A spirit of what? Sonship, right? And by him we cry out, and here's the Greek and, and Aramaic term, Abba, Father, and that, that's the most sensitive way or, 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 or you know, way that you can express your love to your father. And he says, um, but the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, all right? So the focus, when fear comes in, has to begin to change, 
right? What are you focusing on? Are you focusing on the fear that just begins to grow and grow and grow? In the, in the setting that we're in today, then you watch the news and you listen to the radio and you read the emails and you got all this other kind of crazy stuff that's going on and it just consumes you and consumes you and consumes you and consumes you and then you end up being a miserable wreck. And he says, or we can shift that and we can begin to focus on the Father, right? So some of you know, I've, I've mentioned this, I'm the f- five boys in my family, I was the youngest. My oldest brother's 12 years older than me, the one that's next to me was three and a half years uh, older than me, and so uh, he was the one that was killed when he was uh, 17 in a car wreck. And, and so when I was a little guy, right, when I was a little guy, I wanted to play with my brothers. And so my nickname was Me Too, Right? Because every time my brothers are like, hey, we're going to go to the park and play baseball, or we're going to go play wiffle ball, or we're going to play football, or whatever, I would say to my mom, me too, mommy, me too, mommy. Right? And so the rule was in the house that if I went to play with my brothers, that I couldn't cry. If I came back crying, I couldn't play with them. Right? So I grew up fast and I grew up kind of rough because I knew that if I wanted to play football with the big boys, I could not. If I got ran over, duck your head, get down low. I mean, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? And so that was the world in which I live in, right? And so during the day, I had an enormous amount of confidence and a lack of fear until around 8.30, quarter to nine at night. My mom and dad would put me into bed, you know, right? So I was in second grade, so what was I, like 19 or 20 at that time? So... um, you know, so you go to bed at, you know, whatever night, 8, 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden, I don't know if this happened at your house when you were a kid, but things would crawl into my closet and under my bed. And all of a sudden, in our house in Concord, we had a little house. My parents literally was across the hallway from our, their bedroom was across the hallway from mine. So I'm laying in bed, and all of a sudden, you hear things, right? Like, Dad? Dad, what? I think something's under my bed. And then my dad would do like every good dad. He would walk underneath the bed and he'd look under and they'd go, oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys should try that. The kids will never ask you again to come into your room. <laughs> just a side note. So, so my dad would come in and look under the bed, look in the closet, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and I'd go back to bed, right? Now, my dad was a little guy, right? So he was a little guy, but he was incredibly strong. And he was pretty brutal to my older brothers were all like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, and so he could put a whooping to, to some big guys. So I was confident that my dad could take care of, and those of you who know my mom, if my dad couldn't whoop them, my mom could, no doubt about that, right? So I was confident in that, right? And that's what gave me security at night when fear came in that my dad and mom were just a few feet away. Who brings you security in your night or your day? Do you allow the fear to just consume you? Because fear is a great prophet. It prophesies about all kinds of things, doesn't it? And those of you who have that mindset that begins to go, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it will make predictions and it will make forecasts and it will do all kinds of things in your life and it will consume you and you will live literally in like a, a straitjacket, like handcuffed, not being able to move in your life because of fear just consuming you. So whose mind do you listen to? Do you listen to the old nature or do you listen to the new nature? Where do you go? Now, in the Old Testament, when a prophet would prophesy, and they would prophesy, thus says the Lord, and it didn't come to pass, those of you are Old Testament scholars, what did they do to those prophets? They killed them, right? Which I'm in favor of when pastors make claims today that if it's not comes true. Just kidding. Not really. So so when, when fear makes a prediction and it doesn't come true, Should you kill it? You should, right? And remember, 85, 91% of the things that you worry about never come to pass. But, But fear has this idea that just begins to grow and grow and grow uh, in, in our life. And so in, in back to verse 15, it says, and uh, so he says, the spirit does not, uh, that God has given us 
Um, let's read it again. He says that the Spirit of God has not given you, does not make you a slave again to that. You've been set free from that. That, that, is, that is a choice in, in which you make. Now, uh, Pastor Eric read Colossians chapter 1. I'm not going to read it all, but, but you can write underneath it. This is the team that you're on. Right? And in verse uh, 17, it says, He is before all things, and in, and in him all things hold together. That is the team that you are on. So when fear begins to grab a hold of you, do you pause long enough to recognize who your father is? That he spoke the world into existence? And that he holds everything in existence with a spoken word? Do, do you recognize that? Or do you allow the old nature, because the more you think the thought, the easier it is to think that thought. That's the world in which you live in, to just take you and you, you begin to run off into the wild blue yonder. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, 7 says this, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or fear, but he gave us a spirit of power, love, and of self-discipline. Right? So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the fear that we experience isn't from God. God never gave us that spirit. That's part of the old nature. And we, ha- we need to make sure that we recognize that, that, that our thoughts are there, that we turn the focus from our fear to our Father uh, in, in life, and that we don't have that. And in Romans 8, back to Romans 8, 17, it says this, uh, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share In his glory, right? So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a son, you are a daughter of the king, right? And so when fear begins to grab a hold of of us, we need to recognize. You can jot this down on the side. Here's what it says. I, I jotted this down. I said, when I am mastered by the master, he will master my life, right? When I'm, when I am mastered by the master, he will master my life. Meaning that when I surrender and submit to the Spirit of God, which we looked at last week, Spirit of God dwells within us, the more that he has of me, the more successful I will live in a spiritual mindset, not in the old nature. Okay, so a lot of times people feel fearful of like, you know, becoming uh, more faithful or, or allowing God to have more access into their life because, you know, you don't want to be a religious nut and all this other stuff. Actually, the more that you allow him into your life in the sense of submitting to him, the more you become the human that God desires for us to be. And the more that he actually created back before the fall in Adam and Eve, you're full of power, love, and self, self-discipline. Got that? Got that? All right, otherwise I'll be till six o'clock tonight. Number five in your outline. So, that, so number four is I turn my thoughts toward God when I'm afraid. Number five in my outline is I must remind myself that God is good and in control, right? And this is the area of hopelessness and bitterness that we have in our life. And there's a bunch of other things that I could have tied in. In Romans 8, verses 19 through 25, I don't have time to read it, but it basically says this, that we live in a broken world. The world is broke, and broken people live in a broken world, all right? The world cries out with groans, and when you wake up in the morning, and when I wake up in the morning and I get out of bed, I groan. Is anybody else like that? It takes me about 15 steps to feel like my bones are lubricated and ready to go, right? So the world groans because of sin. We groan because of sin. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. You hurt people intentionally. You hurt people unintentionally. They hurt you intentionally. They hurt you unintentionally. That's the world in which we live in, right? And so, so we recognize that in our, in our life. And so because we live in that world, what ends up happening is we experience hopelessness in our life and we experience bitterness. And you can add other things in there as well uh, in, in your life. And, and so in your outline, and this is a, a, a key part, pain in your life is not optional. And you don't have to live for very long to recognize that pain in this world is not optional, But misery is. Misery is a choice that you make. Pain is going to be a part of life. You can be little, you can be old, you can be young, you can be healthy, you can be all kinds of things, and you're going to experience pain in your life. But it doesn't have to take you to a place of misery where Paul says, what a wretched man I am. 
right? You, you, don't, you don't have to live in that world in which your, your mind is in, in a place that's completely miserable. So look what he says in verse 26. And you're going to write down a few things on the side here, okay? He says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do, not, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express, okay? Now, I, I don't know, maybe you, know, maybe you haven't experienced it. I've certainly been in, in places in my life where I'm such a miserable wreck, I don't even know how to pray, I don't know what direction to pray. I don't know, you know, what I should ask for, not ask for. I, I don't know what. It's just like, God, this is not good, right? And, and this is the place where Paul is talking about. And, and, and he says, listen, there are times where you don't know, but the Holy Spirit knows, right? You're confused, but the Holy Spirit is praying for you. And I always think it's cool when people come to me and say, hey, Pastor Ann, I'm praying for you. And there's times where I'll be praying for you guys as well for, for different things. But, but the Holy Spirit is praying for you. I mean, how cool is that, right? That, that the, the Holy Spirit is interceding on your behalf uh, to, to the Father in, in this world. In verse 27, and so you can write down on the little side margin that the, that the Holy Spirit is praying for you, okay? Verse 27 goes on, he says, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind uh, of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So how is the Holy Spirit praying for you? He's praying in accordance to God's will, right? So he's, he's in alignment with that. And verse 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and been called according to his purpose. Now, not that all things are good, because we already know that all things are not good. And not that God causes bad things in your life, all right? A lot of times people think when bad things happen, it's God's punishment, okay? That's not the way that God rolls, all right? So he's not punishing you. He's just given us encouragement here that in all things, good, bad, and ugly, experiences in life, God can turn them to good. Now, you may not know what those good things are, and it may be years, and it may be, and, and I believe in many cases, we won't know until we get to heaven, right? But, but the promise is, is that as we're going through life, there's going to be broken things that happen to people because we live in a broken world, and that we recognize that God is going to turn those things good uh, in our life and for our life. Verse, verse, uh, 29, so you can write down that God uses all things for his good. So he prays for us, he uses all things for his good. Verse 29 goes on, he says, for, uh, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to conform you to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn uh, among many brothers. And verse 30, and those who he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So go back to this, okay? Because this is, this is a key part. So God is praying for you. The Holy Spirit's praying for you. you all, God is going to work all things out for good. And what's he going to do in your life? He's going to use it to conform you into the likeness of Christ. Okay? This is a huge principle for prayer in problems. We pray that God would remove it. God's purpose is to use it to conform us. So when we're praying, God, remove this, we're actually praying contrary to what his purpose is for our problems in life. So we're praying against it, right? Our prayer ought to be, Lord, you want to use this problem to conform me. I want to submit to that so that I'm conformed into your image, Right? Now, the reality is, is that God wants to remove it, too, from your life. But he wants you to grow in the midst of it. And, and this is why oftentimes we go through the same problems over and over and over and over again. You want to know why? Because you haven't learned from it. Right? He wants to use that to conform you. And so, in the midst of the bad things that take place, what's his purpose? His purpose is to conform you. So, he's praying for you, right? He's using all things for, for, for his good to turn you into his uh, likeness. And then verse 31 goes on, that, uh, that um, goes on and says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us, right? Who can be against us? So, verse 32 goes on. 
And it says, he who did not spare his own son, a son but gave him up for all of us, how uh, will he not also along with him great, uh, generously give us, and what's the word? Generously give us all things. Guess what all means? Everything. Yeah, you guys hit the ball out of the park on that. You guys are brilliant. So, so he prays for us. He uses everything, or he turns everything for his good to confirm us into a light, his likeness, and he meets all of our needs. So pause. What are you afraid of? And the answer should be nothing, Right? But when you allow the sinful nature, the old nature, to, to, to live in your mind more often, then that's where you get swept away and you start living in that life uh, of fear. So the all things are health, relationships, you know, uh, debt, finances, jobs, right? coronavirus. I mean, God was never surprised by what we're going through, right? We might have been surprised, but God wasn't surprised. So everything that we go through, it doesn't catch. He's not scrambling in heaven going, you know, alert, 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 right? I mean, he already knows. So, so we, we need to recognize that. And so we, when we fear, we turn our focus to our Father. When we're going through those times, we're reminding ourselves that God is good and God is in control. Amen? Amen. Number, three, and number six in your outline. The sixth one is, I must remember that God never stops loving me. Right, God never stops loving me. I, I mentioned to you that the vast majority of folks who struggle with insecurity have, have an experience in life where they've been abandoned. Somebody has walked out, a father, an, you know, an ex, uh, you know, whatever. They've walked out of their life. And as a result, they begin to build up walls in their relationships because they're trying to prevent the hurt from happening again, Right? And so we carry that mindset into our relationship with God. And then we begin to live on a performance-based relationship. So at, when I'm doing good, like I'm at church, I'm listening to that little Pastor Dan run around, I even laugh at his jokes, God's happy with me. I missed last Sunday, oh, God's sad with me, right? I'm not serving, God hates me now. Right? And we live with that performance thing because to a lot of extent, the people in our, in our, in our surroundings loves us conditionally. And when someone walks out on us, we take that personal. They left because, right? If, if you grew up, which is about 70% of the people, if you grew up and your folks divorced, most of the kids believe that they caused the divorce. So carry that into your adulthood. Right, so, so you have this abandonment issue, you have all this stuff, and then you live in a performance a relationship with God, that when, he, when I do something good, he smiles. When, he, when I do something bad, he frowns and he's ready to squish me. And so our relationship is this performance thing. And when you live in a performance relationship, you're never able to let your guard down and be who you are. Have you ever met someone that's phony, and they put on this air about who they are. And they come in and, you know, they got all the right stuff. And they're saying all the right stuff. And they smell great. And they got all their, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and then you get to know them. And you realize, man, talk about phony baloney. Right? This person is a joke. Right? If we live in a performance-based relationship with our Father, our Heavenly Father, that's exactly what we do. And as a result, we're not able to go deep in our relationship with him because we have all these boundaries and fences up in our life, guardrails in our life, to prevent God from coming in, right, and really having full access. Folks, he knows your thoughts. He knows what you did last night. He knows what you thought when I walked down on the stage, right? He knows all that, and he loves you. And there's nothing you can do to change his love for you. His love is not conditional. His love is unconditional. In fact, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were acting out the most, Christ died for us. In fact, that's why God sent his son to die for sinners. 
right? And, and so we wrestle with that in, in, in our life, and so we have this performance thing, and as a result, re- relationally with God, we're not able to go deep into our relationship, and, and so we kind of splash around the edges of our faith, and then you meet somebody that's like, they just jump off into the deep end, right? It's like, here we go, we're going right in. You're like, man, that's awesome. I wish I could do that. And you're tippy toeing around the edges going, woo, it's cold, woo, it's cold, right? You need to jump in and recognize that you're not gonna surprise God. God's not gonna go, I had no idea that skeleton was in your closet. What a surprise. He's gonna go, yeah, and there's another one too. It's a little farther back in the closet. We haven't addressed that one either, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. So look look what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height uh, height or depth, or anything else in all of creation, just in case I forgot one. Someone's going, oh, you forgot this one in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, right? That you have a relationship based on his pursuing love that is not conditional. And God will never turn his back on you. Others may, right? And there still may may be others in the future who are gonna turn their back and walk out on you. But God will never leave you nor forsake you. That when you're placed in his hand by faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot jump out and he does not shake you loose. You are secure in what he has done for you because we're saved not by our works, but by what Christ has done for us. And when we begin to live in that, we are able to have that natural relationship with him where we can let the guards down, the fences down, the security blankets down and we can be real with him. And we can be honest with him. And we can understand that his love never stops for us. So here's my question. You have two natures if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You have your old nature, shame, right? Lustful thoughts, all the bad stuff we covered. And you have your new nature. Who is winning the battle in your mind? Because here's the amazing thing. It's your choice. It's your choice. You can say, well, you know, it's just difficult to live and we got the internet and we got smartphones and we got this. No, no, no. It's your choice. You are allowing whatever side to win because that's what you're allowing. And this is the dilemma that Paul has. This is the fight that Paul has. And he recognizes that it's, it's in his mind that he wants to do right, but he doesn't do it. He doesn't want to do wrong, but he does it, right? And, and so you have to kind of take a step back and ask yourself, who's winning the battles in my mind? And when you begin to recognize it's maybe the old nature, then you got to change your thoughts. I, just, I gave you six different thoughts that you can begin to change your mindset to have the victory that God desires for you to have in your life. So the very bottom of your outline, I said you got to feed your spiritual life. And this is new to, to those of you who've been in church for any length of time. Prayer, Bible reading, corporate worship, serving the Lord. And there's other habits, spiritual habits that you need to have in your life, right? Those are just, you know, to keep, kind of keep it simple. You need to do that, right? In, in order to get the gunk out of your life, you got to pour the good stuff into your life. You got to flush it, right? You got to flush it. You got you to you get rid of it in your life. And, and so uh, Alicia in the announcements had mentioned next steps. It starts November 7th in your outline. If you've never done that, we cover some of these things in next steps to kind of help you to grow in your spiritual life. And so you can sign up for that and you can become a part of it. It's just, what, a couple weeks away if you want to do that, all right? And so there's a connect card. It should be in the chair around you. If you're online, you can also text us in. Just write your name, write next steps on the back, and you can drop it on the stage like that, and then we'll come and get it, all right? And so drop it in the, uh, there's a b- baskets on the way out this way, and there's a basket out on the way out that way, okay? All right, ready, focus? So hold on, hold on, hold on. They're ready to go. They're like, no, this side over here, they want to go till 515, so just hang out, all right? So, so uh, as I close today, and maybe you're here online or you're here in person, and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. 
See, the amazing thing, as Pastor Eric emphasized today, these promises aren't for everyone. These promises are for those who are in Christ. And how do we, how do we enter into that in Christ? And that is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we do a little ABC. A is admit that we're sinners. Every one of us are sinners, right? We all have issues. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross, that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today or you're watching online and you want to invite Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior, I'm going to say a prayer. You just repeat silently. You don't have to say it out loud. Repeat after me. So I'll ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes. So if you're here in person and you want to invite Christ in your life or you're watching online, just repeat these words silently as I say them. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner and I believe, Jesus, that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, on the back of that card that I dropped on the floor, there's also one there. It says you've committed your life to Christ. If you're here, you can check that. Drop that in the bag if you're on, on... Drop it in the bag. That's the old days, isn't it? In the, in the bucket, the basket in the back. If you're online, you can text the number, all right? So real quick as we get ready to wrap up, on the way out, there should be some yellow sheets of paper, all right? I think it's just one. It's a front and back. And so next week, we're gonna talk about labels that we have in our life. So it's great to have the mindset right, to make sure that we're thinking the way that God desires for us to think with a new nature. But the reality is that some of us have labels in our life because it is true. Maybe we're, you know, we're not reliable. Maybe we have problems with telling the truth. Maybe we have some addiction issues. Maybe we got some struggles in our life. And those are labels that we wear in life, right? And what's interesting is that when we wear those labels, we make decisions and our relationships are affected, our, our, you know, our self-esteem, all kinds of stuff is affected by that label that we wear on us. And so the question is, as believers, do we have to wear that label anymore? And if, we are, if we're new in Christ and the old has passed away, how do we peel that label off? And how do we live the new life that Christ desires for us to live? And so on the way out, there's some uh, yellow sheets of paper. It has to do with self-esteem. I call it Christ-esteem. There's 10, 10 uh, questions that you can ask with some scripture stuff. And then next week, we'll come back and we'll talk about that, all right? So God bless you guys. Have a great week. And I'll let you out at 12.04 because you guys have been the best class of all. God bless you. Wow, what an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend. So be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so that you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us in person whenever you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Lower Ridge family. You can find out more about Lower Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. We can't wait to see you next time. And until then, have a great week. And remember, God loves you.